Oh, hello. This is going to be a little introduction to electrochemistry, and I've got a couple of demonstrations to show you. First one's really quite incredible, but you're not going to be very impressed. And there it is, turning on a flashlight. The uh, flashlight is composed of a light bulb up at the top. This one is powered by a couple of D batteries. And we're going to take a look at how a light bulb operates and how a battery operates. Let me make a little sketch of a picture of a light bulb. Inside the bulb itself, there are a couple of wires going up inside the bulb and a filament, usually made out of tungsten or uh, graphite. And the idea is if we can get electrons to flow through that filament, the filament has the property of glowing. And uh, what we do is work on composite materials so that this thing glows close to white. And people are pretty happy with the white light given off by these light bulbs. They're called incandescent when the electrons race through. The uh, glass or plastic shield over the top is covering this up so that oxygen's not inside of here. So when the bulb is manufactured, oxygen's not inside usually nitrogen, argon, neon, or a vacuum. And this thing is sealed with a couple of contacts, usually something where one wire comes in contact with the bottom of the bulb. And this wire will come in contact with the side of the little socket. And this goes into a little holder inside your flashlight. Now, the idea is electrons race through in one direction, race through that little filament up here, heat it up, it glows. Now, the source for the electron flow is, of course, a battery. Battery doesn't supply electrons in the sense that electrons are leaving. It supplies electrons in the sense that electrons are leaving, I'll show them in this direction, and coming back in on the other side. So a battery makes a loop of electrons. So the flashlight is set up so a couple of batteries are situated like this, and electrons are going ahead and going in a little loop. Well, chemistry inside of a tiny little cylinder. The battery is made out of a zinc cup. And inside is a graphite rod and a slurry. They call these dry cells because they're not liquid, really. It's more of a slurry or some kind of like a solid that's in contact with these. And the idea is the outside zinc cup and the graphite rod inside have different potentials for electrons, what we call EMF, electromotive force. One material wants electrons more than the other, so it's going to pull on electrons. Now, a very simple demonstration that I can visually show you with solutions is set up here on the front counter. I have here some copper 2 plus in solution. And it's beautiful copper blue, as people call it. It's very reassuring. It's very relaxing. They use this in asylums because it relaxes people, copper blue. The copper 2 plus, the copper blue in solution, has a piece of copper metal or a copper electrode something that's going to conduct electrons sitting inside of it. This solution may not look like it's anything other than water because it's clear. Well, there's some zinc 2 plus in the solution. Zinc 2 plus in aqueous, dissolved in water, happens to be cleared. And you can probably guess what electrode material this is. If we have copper in copper 2 plus, we have zinc in zinc 2 plus to make our system very, very simple. So here are a couple of electrodes sitting in solutions. On the board, I made a little picture of this setup. They've got the copper in copper 2 plus. Notice that I'm putting something up here. It looks like a degree sign. I'm putting a zero on copper because we're doing electrochemistry now. We're going to be very concerned with charges. And so it's redundant. That zero doesn't need to be there. But I'm putting a zero on there going, the charge or the oxidation state on copper is zero. It's a solid. It doesn't have a charge on it. It's copper metal. Number of protons equal number of electrons in that copper metal electrode. Over on the other side, zinc 2 plus with some zinc. Now, truth be told, I can't put just copper 2 plus in that left beaker. I need something with a negative charge. So I put in some copper sulfate. I'm going to make a little note here of some sulfate, some SO4 2 minus aqueous. Essentially, the sulfate is a spectator in the sense that it's not going to change oxidation state. It's not going to do any redox, reduction oxidation chemistry. On the other side, I couldn't put in just zinc 2 plus. I also used zinc sulfate. It's very convenient. It's very stable. I could have selected another uh, spectator ion, such as nitrate, zinc nitrate, copper nitrate, but I chose the sulfates. Now, the idea is electrons are going to leave one compartment. And I need to tell you, in a couple of days in our reading, we'll find out why. But the zinc is going to give up the electrons, and the copper is going to gain the electrons. That's the way it is. Copper has a higher affinity for the electrons than zinc. 
So what's going to happen is electrons are going to leave this compartment, this beaker and electrode, travel through the external circuit. I have a little meter up here representing this digital display in volts. So electrons are going to leave by these wires, go through the meter, and come on over to the copper side. So I'm going to make a note up here that electrons are going to flow in this direction. Electrons are going to leave the zinc on the right and go to the copper on the left. We'll find out what the big winner is. You won't be surprised that it's fluorine. Fluorine pulls on electrons more than anything else that we have on our list. Let's see. This is all hooked up. The voltage is reading zero, albeit every once in a while the thousandth place goes ahead and fluctuates maybe a two thousandth of a volt or something. It's just the calibration of the instrumentation. It's really not measuring a potential, meaning a voltage. Now, at this moment, no electrons are flowing through the external circuit. If they were to flow through the external circuit, electrons would leave this side, come on over to this side, and then this beaker would become negatively charged, and this beaker would become positively charged. And that's just too difficult to do, to separate charges. And these beakers, being opposite charges, would just smash into each other on top of the instrument. And that's not going to happen. We don't have the energy in this system to separate charge. So what we need to do is we need to return charge. Negative charge is going to come over to this left side. We need to return negative charge over to the right side. So we use what's called a salt bridge or an electrolyte. This is an upside down glass tube. It's made with fretted glass down at the bottom, meaning that it has openings. When I shake it, little droplets come out. So I'm going to set that inside here. It's filled up with salt water, and now we get a potential. Let me take a look at what this is reading. It typically reads about 1.1 volts minus a little. There we go, 1.1 volts minus a little bit over a volt. So our battery is giving us one volt of potential. That salt bridge, I'm going to make a little picture of it. It looks like an upside down U-tube, a U. It's filled up with a uh, salt water solution and it allows ions to flow through here. As a matter of fact, since we have some SO4 2 minus, the SO4 2 minus ions flow in the opposite direction than the electrons. And I have a question for you. For every one SO4 2 minus that travels in this direction, how many electrons travel in the opposite direction? And the answer is two. This SO4 2 minus has a minus two charge. So when an SO4 2 minus, a sulfate, ion travels from left to right, two electrons, each one negative one, travel from right to left. Now this isn't a very interesting setup in the sense that I'm not doing any work. I have a meter, but I don't have this battery hooked up to like a DVD player, a CD player, an iPod, a motor, a fan. I wouldn't want a fan today. It's probably about 50 degrees outside. But um, I'm not having this hooked up to anything. I'm just using it as an experiment to measure the voltage. But I could put something inside this circuit on the outside. Electrons would travel through and drive a motor or power an iPod and you can listen to music. So we've got ourselves a device, a battery hooked up to a device. Let me pencil in 1.1 volts. The electrodes aren't perfectly polished. It's not all 100% efficient, so we're running a little bit less than that. Let's see some reactions, some reactions that are going on here. On the left side, copper 2 plus is gaining a couple of electrons. Let me write that out. Copper 2 plus is aqueous. It's dissolved in the solution. It's gaining a couple of electrons to become copper metal. Copper zero solid or copper metal. So it's absolutely true for me to say that the mass of this copper electrode is increasing. Copper is plating out. Copper is coming out of solution and landing on the surface of this electrode. The reaction says I'm losing copper 2 plus. So over time, if I were to come back in a couple of days, the solution presumably would not be blue anymore. All the copper 2 plus would end up as copper on top of that electrode. On the other side, the zinc electrode is deteriorating. The zinc atoms are diving in wah, into solution. And they're giving up a couple of electrons when they're doing it. So the zinc is giving up a couple of electrons. And when those electrons leave, they travel up and over and come on over to here because they're gained by the copper 2 plus. On the right side, the zinc dives into the solution and becomes zinc 2 plus. 
we have two what are called half reactions. A half reaction involving the copper and a half reaction involving the zinc. We uh, have it nicely balanced. I have two electrons leaving this compartment and being gained over here by this compartment. So we've built ourselves a battery. On the right side, the zinc compartment, this is where the electrons are being taken away from or the zinc is actually helping push them as well. So this side over here where the electrons are leaving, the zinc zero solid, the metal itself, is what we call oxidized. Oxidized is an old word meaning to have oxygen act on you and oxygen loves taking electrons. Well, zinc is having its electrons taken away. Now, I don't have a very good historical word for this side, but if you look at the charge on copper, copper is going from 2 plus down to 0. It's going from 2 plus down to 0. So what we like to say is the copper 2 plus is reduced. The charge on copper 2 plus, and charge has another name, oxidation number, is going from 2 plus down to 0. So the copper 2 plus is said to be reduced. Reduced. Now, it's going to sound awfully legal here for a moment, but if copper 2 plus is being reduced, something is reducing it. And it that's reducing the copper 2 plus is the zinc. Again, if copper 2 plus is reduced, something's reducing it. And that's going to be the zinc because the zinc is giving up two electrons to reduce the copper 2 plus. So I have one more little line for you, and that is the zinc zero solid is the reducing agent. It's reducing something else, the copper 2 plus. It itself is being oxidized. Having said that, you could probably come up with a name, some type of agent for copper 2 plus. The copper 2 plus is the something agent, oxidizing agent, oxidizing agent. Copper 2 plus is pulling the electrons away from the zinc compartment, so it's oxidizing, taking electrons away. It's the oxidizing agent.